Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Fresh Perspective. With me today, Greta Backer. Thank you so much for joining us, Greta, and giving us your time. And um, when I spoke to Carol Dixon last week, I invented the new word, wisdoms. So that's a classic example of mother tongue in- interference. So yeah. I look forward to all the wisdoms that you will also share with us today. Yeah. So uh, just to kick off, what, you, what, what, it is, what is it that you do? Yeah, what is it that I do? Francois, I always dread that question when people say, what is that that you do? I do a lot of things. Yeah, so I think it's, it's that I'm not a clinical psychologist, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a GP. I think the day brings to me what I'm going to do and which hat I'm going to put on for that day. Um, you know, I'm also borrowing from Heidi Schleifer, who you know. Heidi was talking about she's in the autumn of her life. And I think I've got the privilege as well to be in the autumn of my life. So when we refer to COVID-19, I'm one of those that should stay home because <laughs> I'm in the risk category. But um, that with that age, I think it brings to me a lot of privileges that um, I can just be for the day. So what do I do to earn a living is uh, Imago Relationship Coaching. The old way is they refer to it as marriage counseling. But Francois, you and I know that it's way more than marriage counseling. That's an old age word. Yes. So I work with couples. I love the time that I spend with, with couples and guiding them and coaching them to a place where the other one's otherness is not scary anymore. Other ones, otherness is not scary anymore. Okay, I already have two questions for you, Greta. So one is, I like the perspective on the privilege of yeah. being in the autumn of your life. So first talk about that, and then we'll talk about not being scared of the other's otherness. Yeah, yeah. So when I started out as a, a young teacher, it was frenziness and it was busyness, and it was that... You know, I need to get a career. Uh, and, and then people will ask you, what is it that you do? And I think that's the question that's, that's kind of scary because invariably when I would say to them, I'm a marriage counsellor, there will be two reactions. They will either get this dull, blank expression and start looking where they can escape. <laughs> <laughs> or they start telling about, about their problems and how they either they've got this amazing marriage and they share with me all their wisdom and that they share it's plural with the wisdoms they share with me all their wisdoms um yeah so that's the one part what what do i do where were we with this question? You see, I, mean, <laughs> I wanted to know why you call it the privilege of being in the autumn yeah. of your life. Yeah. So now when, when I meet someone and they ask me what I do, I, I can choose for that day what is it that I do. So, okay. yeah, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure, Francois, you also saw this uh, video clip, um, David Jones. Let's celebrate, well, it's not even a clip. It's a long section. It's an um, educational, motivational mini movie that he made. David Jones um, has always worked for National Geographic. And they then gave him this um, um, job to, to make this, this motivational movie. And he called it, let's celebrate what's right in the world. Mm. And I think that paved the way for me to say, you know, when I say I'm in the autumn of my life, is that I can now celebrate each little moment as it shows up. So when you ask, do I see my grandchildren at this stage? So when I'm with, with Katie or when I'm with Lily, 
I show up as a grandmother. And if I have an interview with you, I show up as me. And all, all the curiosity about what Francois brings and what Francois is doing in his life. So here's a new word, presencing Francois. I think with, with reaching the age where I am, I grant myself the privilege to just be present with whoever I'm with at that specific moment. And that brings me to the work that I do with couples now. I, I know they come to me to sit in my presence. And this is not, it doesn't come from a conceited place. It's because I'm grounded and I, I've been there, done that, I've got most t-shirts and I can just <laughs> be myself at this stage and I can bring my wisdom. Um, I can just bring my wisdom and what I've learned and experienced in my own relationship. I can bring to the couple, obviously with all the theories that we've got. There's this drilling outside now. You must tell me if you can hear it. I, I can still hear you. So okay. that's so part of you, my, I'm okay, okay with that. Okay, so you will stop when it's too loud. Yeah, thank you. you see, this is life happening, Francois, and it yes. shows up. And I don't go into a flat spin anymore. This is life. If we need to stop, we stop. And so back to this um, um, clip, David Jones, let's celebrate what's right in the world. There's a section in that movie where he goes to Scotland and he's going to interview a master weaver. And he says he arrives there after quite a long journey and quite a walk because it's quite secluded on a hill. He arrives there and it's the small little unimpressive house she opens the door and she says you will just have to wait a bit now remember this is this world-renowned <laughs> uh, national geographic photographer arriving there and she says you will just have to wait a bit because my brother whom I'm looking after is sick so I need to go and take care of him and then she eventually she comes back and they go to the loom and he asks her all questions and he's now photographing her in the process. And he says to her, so what do you think of when you weave? And she, without taking a moment to think about it, she said to him, when I weave, I weave. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. And so when we have ha having this conversation, we are having this conversation. And for couples, if, if they allow that little bit of wisdom to land, when we are having a fight, we are having a fight. And when we are making love, we are making love. And we do not allow the fight to interfere with what we're doing now. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. Yes. <laughs> but, but you have to unpack that some more. So um, I, I want to know more about that presencing, uh -huh. being present, but also not being afraid of the other's otherness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in all the years that I've been working with couples and guiding them, actually back to their own full aliveness to be who I should be in this world and not be scared to, to laugh, to cry, to, to be who I am at this moment. In my work with couples, I've realized that it's always the fact that you are so different from me that will creep into the relationship and when you, when you are so different, I do not know what to do with that. I've actually experienced it now um, in the first three weeks of lockdown with Liz. Test and where I am tested <laughs> in the relationship. And I realize that we, we are amazing friends. We like doing the same things. We've got a nice rhythm where we we really in the same rhythm. But sometimes 
I look at him and I think, wow, I wouldn't have done it that way. Wow. <laughs> um, you always say wow. <laughs> I think it to myself. Yeah. Um, and I realized in the two, two times that I was really upset with him, where he pushed my buttons, it's when he was so different from me. So he, Len knows what he wants in life. And he claims what he wants in life. I'm different. I'm this respectful, obedient, always taking, you know, considering everybody else, your needs come before my needs, which is a lovely personality trait, I would say. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but sometimes Len pushes my button in that place. I'll give you an example. Uh, yesterday morning again. Um, he, he, he got up and he decided, that's it. It's time to get up. And I was in a nice, deep sleep. And I think I had quite a nice dream as well. <laughs> and it was like rudely, you know, that's it. Open the curtains. That's, it's time to get up. And I thought to myself, no, man, have a little respect this side. I still want to sleep. But what he wants, he acts out. And he claims it, fully alive. He claims that. And I feel disrespected. So you see the otherness there, mm. where I wouldn't do that. So I get up in the morning and I see he's still fast asleep. I get up quietly. I go down the passage. I make my coffee, talk, talk to the dog. Because I don't want to disturb him. But what's the lesson for me in this whole thing? You see, Francois, I've learned with couples, it's when you push my buttons in that place where you are so different from me, I need to look to, to me inside of what's happening inside of me. Why am I so sensitive to your behavior? And nine out of ten times, that's the guiding light for me that I need to reclaim something in my life, that I need to put something back in my life. So in previous years, I would have described him as extremely selfish. But now I say, mm -mm. what is it that I need to put back in my life? What can I learn? What page can I take out of Len's book? Because... The fact that he's so different from me in that specific place, that's my guiding light to show me where I can change, grow, heal maybe, if that's the word you want to use in relationships. Do I make sense? Very much. So let me, let me kind of mirror it back to you, right? So what I oh. hear is that the, the person you are in a relationship with, they are very different from you. So Len is very different from you. And the areas where he is most different, that pushes your buttons. But yes. in those areas that is so different that it actually pushes your button, that's where you are invited to grow and, and to heal and to connect to something within yourself. Yes. You've got it spot on. Okay. So, meaning, on. so meaning that that you very nice and considerate, but you can take that page from Len's book and say, sometimes it's okay for me to go for what I want. Yep. And not be too yes. worried about how it affects other people. Yes, yes. Because, you see, I can become so subservient, so um, looking after others, taking care of others, that I don't take care of myself enough. Yeah, so if I don't fill my own teacup with love, patience, care, I can't give it out to you. And at some point in time, it's going to turn and, and it's going to develop into something. And Afrikaans say once a sunny yammer hut. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm going to fall into the poor me, the victim mode. Yes. So Lynn is my teacher, my constant teacher, that it is okay to have my own boundaries. It is okay to sometimes say, no, I'm going to read a book now. You go and make your own tea. Yeah. Even so, if it feels wrong because of the way you were brought up. Or... Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, um, yes, the other person's otherness is there for you. It's, it's a mirror. You, you talked about mirroring just now. The other person's otherness is he's hold or she is holding up a mirror for you to say, okay, what's happening in my life? What is my history? What is it that I'm bringing into this moment here and now that I'm triggered, that I'm feeling hurt or sad or rejected or angry? Because invariably we'll feel angry. That's what we can feel in the body. Uh, my, my heart will pound my my. I'll start sweating. Um, your body will tell you when you're triggered. But then to just, all right, what's underneath here? What is it that I need to let go of? Or what is it that I need to learn in this situation not to be triggered so much? Amy says it nicely. She talks about the... Um, uh, the way we are, everything is in our um, uh, history. Um, it, it, it comes into who I am at this stage. Yeah. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense to me, Goethe. So yeah. would you say that, that that fear of the other person's otherness is like the most common thing you help couples deal with or work through? Yes, it's it's difficult to to really love um, when you are so different from me. Um, you, you know, when we meet do, do each you mean, other. Sorry, Ingrid, do you mean so, that it's difficult to love if if I see your the fact that you're so different as as a problem, or what do you mean? No, it's absolutely a gift. Oh. It's a gift. Um, um, if 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 I have to be married to to myself <laughs> it would be quite boring yes. so no we need the other person um, in our life to to show us and to help us reclaim full aliveness mm. uh, as as therapists we we know that story about how our history plays off into the here and now but do you mean that difference is what makes it hard for couples to, to love one another sometimes? Because they don't understand that that difference is actually the, the gift. Yes, yes. Okay. That um, makes sense. That, because when, and in that spot, because I'm not readily, it's not in my consciousness at that moment when um, I get triggered. Is it's not in my consciousness. I just know you're irritating me now. You, but underneath that, there, there will be something like you're inconsiderate. Yes, like um, a story you make up that explains that behaviour. Yeah. So you will find once you get to that place, that neighbourhood, or that emotion, whatever you want to call it, that. Underneath the anger is the feeling that you're inconsiderate. You don't care about me, so you have to drill it down. You're inconsiderate. What's underneath that? You you do not care. You only care about yourself. So invariably, you don't care about me. And once you land in that place, you can go and say to yourself, all right, let me go back in my history and see if this is a common place for me, emotional landscape for me to land that I feel you don't consider me, I feel neglected, whatever the case may be. And once you're there and you can join the dots, you can build your own puzzle, you can see the whole picture, and then I can do something consciously about it. Um, because we're getting triggered in an, in an unconscious way. We're not always sure why it is that you... Um, so for instance, if... if 
I don't know what happens between, there's a dance between each and every couple. Um, And it'll manifest in something like, you never open the door for me. When we're at a party, you never pour me a drink. You never ask me whether I would like something. So what's underneath that? Again, I don't matter. And when you're there, you can say to your partner, you know what, when that happens and you do not actually acknowledge me, you don't ask me whether I need a drink, you just stand by the fire and have chit chat with your friends, you'll forget about me. Okay, let's see, why is this such a difficult place for you to be? You forget about me. And when you start drilling down back into the past, what I've experienced with one uh, woman is that she eventually remembered how her mom, who was an artist, would be so into her painting that she would lose track of time. And she would forget that it's two o'clock and she needs to be at the school to pick up her little 10-year-old daughter. And this little girl would sit well, those days it was safe. It's not a recent story. That um, she would sit there on the pavement and one by one, all the kids' parents would pick them up and there she sits, totally alone, neglected, forgotten about. Um, And then the teacher would come out and say to her, just come and sit in the classroom and I'll phone your mums. So so you get that neighbourhood of feeling you don't care about me so now fast forward to the bride and, and, and him, the husband, who's supposed to love her. Because what does love look like and feels like to her? You will see when I need you. You will see that you need to take care of me. And that happens. And in, in that moment, we fall into the unconscious past. Mm. Uh, and you become that little girl sitting outside the school on the pavement, forgotten. Mm. And the story you start to believe about yourself is that I'm not important. I'm not important enough for you to take care of me, to look out for me. To remember. So once the couple gets to that point where they can have that conversation, things shift. Uh, in the, the relationship. Understanding the, the real story. Understanding the real story, um, getting the, you know, my, my history, uh, understanding my history. Um, Dan Siegel has got a nice uh, a way of putting it, uh, Francois, and, and you will know this. He talks about interpersonal neurobiology. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So everything happens between people um, and and it's in the brain, but also in the biology. We can't uh, pull them apart. They're not separate entities. It's one. So when the body tells me and it goes into the emotion that I'm angry or sad or whatever, it's the history in the brain. <laughs> it's because that's where everything is stored. My whole past, my all my previous experiences are stored, stored there. But it's only when I'm in relationship with somebody else that you're going to push my buttons. If I'm on my own with my dog and my buddy, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. No triggers. No, yeah. Yeah. And your kids will do the same thing. Eh? The kids will also push your buttons in that place where you need to come out of just reacting in the body to a place of, all right, where does this come from? Um, join the dots, build a bridge, and see what's in your past. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Greta. So can you maybe... Share with us the the different approaches you use, the different techniques you use to help couples do that, to embrace the otherness and and see, you know, visit the past to see what's what's the real story. Why am I feeling certain emotions when you do this or not do that? What tools do you use to help and guide couples do that? Now, 
Yeah. I'm, because of my age and the fact that I'm in the autumn of my life, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, you know, I have looked at a lot of different approaches to relationships. So each, each couple is unique. So when they arrive, I just first get onto the same page as they are and uh, I get into their space. I ask them a lot of questions to, to just get a feeling of what's living in the space um, between the two of them. Um, and when I talk about the space, I mean what's in the relationship? Hmm. What, what is the climate in the relationship? Um, and then I will draw on theory to, to normalize it for them. So this is where I'll draw on the Imago theory and I will explain to them that there's a natural progression for all relationships, that we start from the romantic stage, which is a bi biological-induced wonderful euphoria, <laughs> which can't last, <laughs> um, that, that it's... It's a natural progression for all relationships to fall into a place where there's a struggle. Um, and sometimes it's a real power struggle. And sometimes it's just that fact that you are so different from me, I made a mistake. And I do not know how to, to work with your otherness. Um, so I would first of all just explain to them that's a natural progression for all relationships. Mm -hmm. And then I go, and I, I find this is very important, that couples need to understand that love is really completely different from romantic love. Mm -hmm. They will say, but I'm not in love with her anymore. Of course you're not in love anymore. You can't be in that romantic stage forever. It's just impossible. Biologically, it's impossible. And then I, I draw on and I explain to them that it's a choice that you make. Um, love is the choice that you make to stay with the other person and that you're going to come and do this work with a coach, a guide, a therapist um, to understand the dynamic between the relationships. Um, and I bring in Edith Eder's book. I don't know whether you've read her book. I think if there's one book that I advise each and every person to read, it is Edith Eder's book, The Choice. It's The Choice, um, the choice yes. I haven't um, read, read that, but I uh, will. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing book. So it's very similar to Viktor Frankl's book. Oh, wow. Answers for, for Meaning. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because okay. the two of them both survived the Holocaust. Oh, okay. Yeah. But where he focuses in his book on what is it that I need here to actually survive, she suffered from a, a lot of survival guilt. So her book focuses more on, on that side of survival guilt. But um, it's all about the choices that I make in life. Um, and I think the fact that they were in in those horrible, horrible circumstances, you know, she describes uh, in a book that when at the end of the war, when she was saved, she was she was in amongst a lot of other corpses, and with she summoned, she says, with the last piece of energy she had, she just summoned this cry so that people could realize there's one living person amongst this heap of bodies. Can you imagine? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the choice that she made every step of the way as in, in the concentration camp, oh, she, she tells the story of how she was summoned to go and dance for Mengele. Now imagine you, you need to go on stage where all the soldiers are now having their fancy meal and laughing and having beer and having a cigarette, and she's on stage, she's doing ballet for them. And she says that she chose 
to go in her mind to a place where she thought she was on, I think it stayed in Vienna in the opera theater there and she was dancing there. The choice that we make for survival mm. and the choice that we make for commitment. Amazing book. So I, I, I show my couples that and I say to them, you need to choose for this relationship. Mm. It's easy to run away, but you need to choose for this relationship. Once you make that choice, we get closer to, to real life. Um, Sue Johnson of Emotional Focus Therapy, she also puts it nicely. She says, love is only a word until you give meaning to it. Isn't that beautiful? Mm, very powerful. So, yeah. So in my approach with couples, that uh, they need to know that you, th where you find yourself now, challenged in this relationship, that's normal. All couples go through that, <laughs> and you will go through that until you're grey and eighty. Uh, it's it's always going to be there, but you're not going to get stuck in that horrible place of I don't speak to you, you you're so weird, you're so this, you're so that. Is that then the difference to, between, between conflict that, that gets stuck and conflict that actually moves you forward? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The choice. It's the choice you make. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the fight and flight, the, the aggression that lives in the subconscious mind. It's in the reptilian brain. It's instinctive. There's no logic. There's no reasoning there. If you go into the biology of the brain, you're going to see where that sits. Mm. We, we designed that way to get away from danger. Sometimes Len is flipping dangerous <laughs> in my <laughs> subconscious mind. Yes. In yes. my subconscious mind because he's so different from what I am. Because that is what it stands for. So, yeah, it's it's the, the normal progression of relationships then the choice that you make to be in this relationship and then to start um, working on, on the relationship. Is there a stage we have, Sorry, Goethe, please go ahead. Sorry. No. We, you asked about presencing as well. So that's the next step then, that okay. once you choose for this relationship, and this is where Sue Johnson comes in, then you need to start acting so that you give meaning to the word love. And then we start working with, so what does love look like, feel like, smell like for you? And I, and I assist the couple to really become present for themselves, but also present for the other one. Mm. And this is the new word, presencing, you, you, you know, that Humish life and useless, he created that word, present sing. Um, so I think that the modern day word is to be mindful. Hmm. Is, there, and, yeah. is there any stage that you, because, because I, I don't know if you get this question, I get it a lot. Um, when do you know it's time to leave? How, how do you help couples know how and when to make that decision? Um, again, it's the choice you make. Mm. It's the choice you make. Um, and that, uh, and, and so what's feeding your decision making process? We're all different. So the one will come from a biblical background where they will say, the Bible tells you you should not divorce unless this and this. So if that's your framework, your Guiding principles, um, you know, we've all got guiding principles, but you know, Francois, when people decide to stay in the relationship because it's too shameful, this is spanner um the sky. Yes, uh, it's I wrong. Feel so, oh, I feel so sorry for them because yeah. then pride comes in the way and they are too proud to go and see somebody. That's sad. Can, That's can, sad. can you relate to this, Greta? What, what I found, well, you brought in the, the Bible now, and, and what's fascinating for me to see is 
people that come with that mindset and it's wrong to get divorced and so forth, they struggle to make that choice, to make that commitment. And I've never thought of it, of it as, as pride, but it makes sense to me when you say that because they will – they will not do the work. They will not do some of the exercises that I give them to do to help them reconnect and move forward and move to that definition, defining of love, like like um, you know, give meaning to the word love. I call it defining love for yourself. Um, they won't do that work, but they will pray for one another. Oh. And the prayer will always be focused on changing the other person. Yeah. I'm just praying for the Lord to soften his heart. I'm just praying that God will show her a new way or help her understand. The prayer is not even focused on themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. It's, it's, it's prideful, actually. Yeah. And it's, it's, it damages the relationship even more. Oh. Franchine, I think what, what I hear from you as, as well um, is that It's easy then. So when, when people pray in that way, they do not accept the responsibility of what is my part in this relationship. So you ask me, well, why do I use theories and principles? So this is the other guiding principle in working with, with couples, that they need to know that each one is 100% responsible for what happens in their relational space. It's not the one that's wrong, selfish, lazy, obnoxious, uh, <laughs> alcoholic. There are two people in the relationship. But now when, when there was an affair, um, you know, it's very easy to be self-righteous and say, oh, but it's you who had the affair, you the culprit, you the one that was so sorry, and you the one that was changed. And this is where it becomes becomes very difficult then for the poor party who was not the affair of mm. <laughs> is there such a word? <laughs> there is one now. I'm all for creating new words. We've got wisdoms, presencing and affair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what would you call him or her. The adulterer, I think. Would be. No, yeah. Well, the one that didn't Stray, oh. didn't have their fear. So it's very difficult and, and you need to work very softly and slowly because they righteously indignant or it, what is the word? They in, what is the word I'm looking for, Francois? Help me. Say again. Indignant. They've they've got a right to be indignant oh, about yeah. what's happened yeah. in the relationship. It makes sense that it hurts them and they, they, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then for them to accept, and, and they will say to me, don't tell me I'm, I'm uh, also part of this thing that I've got a, a part to play in this affair. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. And that's yeah. a place where you need to sit long with soft eyes and lots of empathy um, in that place, yes, both of you create the climate in this relationship. Um, I know I had a young uh, dad uh, said to me um, the one day that, you know what, I don't even want to go home anymore because when I arrive there, um, they're both on the TV. They don't even get up and come outside to say hello to me. And I've worked the whole day to provide for our family. Mm. He says, so when I walk in there, nobody walk, uh, looks up and they just carry on with their TV games or cooking or whatever they're busy with. He says, I just want to turn around and walk and go back to the office. Mm. So that's the, the environment. You know, you, you, the two people at home is creating an environment for this young guy to say, hmm. I'm going to go somewhere where somebody is at least pleased to see me, where there's a warm pair of eyes say, wow, it's you, hello. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And that's the hard part in the relationship, to own up and take responsibility for my part in creating what's going down in the relationship. So again, it's back to choice, eh? Do, do I choose to take responsibility 
for for my part in what's going down in the so here's something that I found very uh, okay. interesting. Sorry, Greta, the line, the internet froze up now. I didn't catch the last bit. Um, it's easy to just blame and say it's it's you and project everything that's wrong in the relationship on the other one. You need to show up. You need to make a choice to take responsibility for your part in the breakdown or the conflict or what it is so conflict is the other wonderful thing you know when a couple arrives and and they say oh this was great front row this was great a young couple comes um and we now getting to know one another and he said to me out of the blue he says i just need to tell you uh we've been married now for five years and i think we've just had our top a top best fight ever in the car on the way here. Out of the, <laughs> the top three, I think this was the top one. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, he's still seeing white, he's still very angry and whoa, he doesn't know how they're going to do the work. And then, you know, to use the conflict and to say to them, guys, you need to really rethink conflict. Mm. That is the gift in the relationship. Yes, yes. Preach it. <laughs> Preach it, yeah. Preach so it. I, I listened to what they had to say about what went down and immediately then and then I said to them, oh, I, I wish I was in the car. I wish I could have observed what was happening then. I said to them, don't you want to continue? And he says, yes, because let's fall. <laughs> 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 so... Right then, then uh, I allowed them. I said to them, "You know, I'd love to see this for five minutes," and and they went right back into that fight. And then I stopped them. Uh, and again, use that as, as a teaching moment to say mm-hmm. to them, "Right, we, yeah, you've now been captured. The reptilian brain took over. It's fight and flight. Let's do a different thing." Mm-hmm. And then I teach them. Um, this whole new way of just leaving your world, mirroring the other one, visiting the other world, and deeply listening to what's happening there. And it was an amazing session. Mm. Um, But fortunately for for me, they have been to a typical Imago session, so they knew about mirroring and the dialogue. Okay. So I didn't have to teach them that. Because, uh, as you know, it's difficult to listen, eh, Francois? Ask yes. me. Yes. It's, yes, it's hard work to yeah. read this one. Yeah, hard work. Oh, my word. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I have another, another, another comment slash question for you, Greta, uh, regarding choice. Yeah. What, what, I, what I recently learned is that we, we may have a lot of options, but we only get one choice. And I, I like to think of it that way because uh, when people ask, should I leave or should I stay? You know, the way they stay, there's a lot of options there. The way they leave, there's a lot of options there. The reasons, like, is it the spiritual? The Bible says I'm not allowed to get the divorced. So I will stay, but it'll, I'll make it horrible. I'll make it as, you know, as, 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 um, unbearable as I can for the other person to be in this relationship. Mm-hmm. Maybe until they cheat and then I can go, okay, there you go. Now yeah. I know I, I you know I have I have the, the right to leave now. But mm-hmm. even though you have all these options, you you actually only get one choice. Mm-hmm. So sometimes people, it seems to me, don't understand that. They they want to have more than one one choice. They want to stay mm-hmm. but also leave. Mm-hmm. Mm. And so you they, can't they, have both. Not, they're not really staying. They, mm. they actually made the choice to leave, but they think they made the choice to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you comment comment on that? It's just like a, a something I learned recently. Yeah. I think what I'm doing that in that instance, I would really cross into the other person's world and I would really listen to them. Because you know, Francois, the moment somebody else mirrors your thoughts, your feelings about something, 
you're really looking into a mirror and mm. you, you're getting to know yourself. And if somebody just stay present, stays present for your reality, the penny will drop eventually and mm. you will have this aha moment, hopefully. So I would really just cross the bridge, stay present for their story because when, when, when a couple comes, I, I deeply believe that they know the best for their relationship and what's best for themselves. I trust their inner wisdom. Yeah. And I tell them, I really trust that your essence will come out. Mm. The fact that I... I'm half in, half out. I want to do my own thing. That's not essence. Essence is that I want to laugh. I want to be happy. I'm creative. I'm passionate. Mm -hmm. That's essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll listen, listen, listen to them and say, all right, so what is it that you hear your inner wisdom is saying? Mm -hmm. And I'll validate that and I'll respect that. But then... How do you choose to lead the rest of your life? Lurking between, you know, and not being happy. Um, you know, walking into an environment where it's dark, it's gloomy, it's full of fights. Or what, where, where do you want to live? Choose that. And then the difficult part about this work is then closing the exits for each one. Can you say what, what do you mean by that, Greta? What, what, are, what are exits? Oh, yes. Oh, we've got so many exits. They're wonderful exits. So instead of um, spending 80% of my energy, my full aliveness in the space with you, our relational space, the marriage, the family, I will take my energy, my enthusiasm somewhere else. So some people will start running. I always wonder about the Congress Marathon Runners. <laughs> is it really a passion? Or <laughs> is, it, is it the fact that you need to just escape the duty, the heaviness, the burden, the responsibility of the family, and now you've got an excuse, very honorable excuse, to take yourself out of the space for hours on end because we're all Iron Man. So we could run. When Len and I, when we were in a difficult patch in our relationship, I went back to university. Mm -hmm. How honorable was that? How amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I went back to well, But I used it as an excuse to escape the intimacy of the relationship. Mm -hmm. So some people will cook and bake. Some people will get tremendously involved in the church, in the school, they're on each and every board. So in a nutshell, I take my energy, my enthusiasm somewhere else where I'm recognized, mm -hmm. where I feel fulfilled, and then this word, where I feel fully alive. Makes sense. Fully alive is the is the thing. So, you know, when somebody must choose, am I staying or am I leaving? Is where do I want to be fully alive? Will you really be fully alive with the next relationship with the next person? Because believe you me, the dance will follow you into the next relationship. <laughs> you know that as yes, well. Very true. Mm. Yeah. And, and how do you help couples close those exes once they've identified them? Oh, it's a choice. It's a decision. Mm. It's it's no, no magic in that one. You need to choose that uh, I'm going to close that exit. So for some people, it can't be just poof, close. So it'll be a gradual, uh, it's like a smoker. You, you can't just go cold turkey and give up all cigarettes, although some people won't do that, and they had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's a gradual process, and then you work with a couple. So what is it that you can do for now that's comfortable for you? Because you also know, Francia, that we find that some, and this is maybe now, 
jargon, uh, our jargon that we're using, the cleaner and the distancer yes. uh, will be attracted to each other. So you need to work with that carefully, slowly, uh, but sometimes it's a cold turkey, especially when there was an affair. Uh, you need to close that door. There's no ways that you can work on your relationship and still see the other person once a month. It's, it's just not. So it's, again, back to the choice that you make. The, the here and now, do I choose for the relationship? And then do I choose to be fully alive in this relationship? Because if you... Uh, if, if it's going to be a long, drawn-out battle, people will get sick. So then I think rather leave the relationship. Oh, makes sense. When do you say to people leave, Francia? Say again, what, what do I? What would you advise people when they ask you, do I need to stay or me? do I need to get a divorce? For What's me, your? Yeah, for me it's about knowing um, why. Mm -hmm. Are you leaving to escape something and do you know what that something is? Because mm -hmm. usually that something is, like you've explained in the beginning of this conversation, within yourself. Mm -hmm. So when you leave, you're taking yourself with you mm -hmm. and you take that self into the next relationship and that's why, as you also know, Greta, the pattern will repeat. Mm -hmm. So even when people have an affair, they leave their marriage. Mm -hmm. To be with the person they had the affair with, mm -hmm. they see, oh no, mm -hmm. now you changed into my ex wife. You, you the same, but actually it's, they are the same. And they just attract the same kind of things mm -hmm. that actually are there to help them heal and grow, mm -hmm. that push those buttons. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, that's it. If you've done everything to make sure that you are the best version of yourself, mm -hmm then you will know how to make that choice. So here's another way that I, that I try and do that, Greta. Maybe you, you can um, comment on this. So I try and explain it in, in terms of levels and standard, mm -hmm. the standard according to which they live. So when they are in that battle, in that fight, mm -hmm. there's a certain level on which they engage, They're on that level. But if one person chooses to raise their standard, meaning you know this, Greta, when, you, when you're in a fight, mm -hmm. you're not your best self. You're not mm -hmm. the way you actually want to be. You don't feel the way you want to feel. You don't think and say things that you actually mean or want to say. Mm -hmm. You're substandard in, uh, according to your own standards. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's when you, when you are able to raise that standard and be the person you want to be, regardless of what the other person does or doesn't do, then you'll have the perspective to understand mm -hmm. and make a choice that's healthy. Yeah. Then you'll be able to say, yes, I should leave or shouldn't leave. Yeah. Yeah. But what happens most of the time in my experience, when one person doesn't want to come to any kind of coaching therapy session, but the other does, and they and this happens. Mm -hmm. This invites and challenges the other person to also raise their standard yeah. because now this one is treating the other one differently. Yeah, love and respect because yeah. something inside changed. Yeah. And when this happens, the yeah. divorce isn't the, the the option on the table anymore. It's how that yeah. how can we improve this? Yeah. But if it doesn't happen, they have an answer. They can make the choice not yeah. reactively, but yeah. Yeah. Consciously. Yeah. That's what helps me. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you, in, 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 if I put it in my language, is that um, if if the one is not prepared to come to therapy, um, and the one who wants to do the work, you can do the work on your own. Um, yeah. You can become the best version of yourself that's possible. Uh, once you, with therapy, become the best version of yourself, obviously you can stay present for the other one's meltdowns and the fact that he or she is so different from you because you come from a more mature, grounded place where you've got compassion for the other one. But you need the other person to trigger you 
-hmm. so that you can get to know yourself so that you can love that part in yourself to become a better person. You know, I'm I'm reading out Joyce Meyer stuff uh, and listening a lot to her her work again. She's also got a lot of the wisdom. Um, So I tap on her wisdom. And um, she actually said that because she came out of an abusive relationship with her dad and um, the childhood that was less than ideal, she couldn't she couldn't even love herself. Mm. And if you cannot love yourself, there's no ways that you can love somebody else. Absolutely. Okay? So when we do the work on our own with our own therapists, we learn to love ourselves. We can accept the grace from above. Mm. And then we can really give that love out to somebody else. So she, she said that, um, she's so grateful for her second husband, Dave, I think his name is, that's in her life, because she says no matter how she performed, lost her temper, mm-hmm. uh, he still loved her. And his love for her, that constant, warm, predictable love that she saw in him opened her heart mm-hmm. to become the woman she is now. And I, and yeah, so there's something in that as well. If we can just learn to love ourselves, and now we're not talking about a narcissistic love, no. uh, but that you know, deep love, and then I can give it to you, and I can stay again, I can stay present for your meltdowns. Yeah. Um, and eventually, I'm learning now. I'm a slow learner, Francois. That <laughs> when Len and I go in a in a meltdown, when the reptilian brain takes over and we go into our fight and flight mode, I can sometimes now I can say, "Wow, let me just take a deep breath because I'm way too triggered now." Yeah, and that's a way of loving myself to to know I need to give myself space now i need to just ground myself again and then i can talk to you yes absolutely good no i can identify with that for me it's like how do i stay connected to the person i want to be when i'm triggered you know when when nicolene and i and we we go into that conflict kind of space Mm -hmm. how do i stay connected to the person i want to be that person who's, who's caring and loving and present you know, it's understanding, has clear boundaries, so it does not take responsibility for things that he, he cannot control, yeah. um, but is, is, is present. It's not blaming, it's not defensive. Yeah. And when I'm able to do that, um, something that would have been a fight in the past, yeah. it's nothing at all. Yeah. Yeah. We get the information from the conflict and then, okay. Yeah. It's actually, I, I'm, I'm triggered because of my own stuff, because of my, the story I make up of why she didn't do that or why she did that. I make a story yeah. up there to explain yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. But relationships, are, it can be amazing, but it's also challenging. And that's why we need people like you and me and all the other um, Imago-trained relationally trained therapists say because you cannot really work with a relationship coming from the individual paradigm. Yeah, definitely. There is, you know, there's something about that. But, but I also know, uh, we've just talked about it, if, if I don't work with myself, um, then I can't be present for anybody else in my life. And what's, what's great about the conflict within a relationship, it actually helps me set up the agenda of my growth. It, it helps me plot the path oh, yes. of where I need to focus yeah. and what I need to work on. Yes. Because the thing that upsets me, yeah. angers me, hurts me, makes me sad, yeah. it makes me feel, it's, it's my story. It's me. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm angry. Yeah. And, Absolutely. And, yeah, that's, so that becomes the agenda, which I think yeah. is... Is one of the great gifts. Yeah. But Francia, that's the difficult part. And I think that's why couples don't really want to do the work. Is to, to be so conscious and so mature about the fact that it's my stuff. <laughs> it's it's difficult to take responsibility. It's me 
It's yeah. easy to project it all onto you and say you need to change. We started there yeah. in this conversation. Yeah. It's you that must do this. You must change. Become more attentive. Do less that. Uh-uh. <laughs> um, <laughs> the work is this side. The work is this, this side. And eventually you would be able in um, in a conversation, tell your partner that when you do this, it leaves me feeling blah, 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 blah. Yes. Definitely. I call that that healthy selfishness. So I'm just playing around with words to try and, and make that clear. But when you're focusing on what the other person is doing, that's the most selfish you can be. Yeah. Because that it's not about the other person. It's about you. Yeah. But when you start just focusing on yourself, really become self-centered in a healthy way, what can I do? What can I control? What am yeah. I thinking and feeling? What do I believe? Because yeah. those things, like you said earlier, you're 100% responsible for those yeah. things. Yeah. If I focus on that, the way I see the other person changes drastically. Yeah. It's a, wow, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank it feels you. like we can just keep on going. So maybe yeah. next time we should do a whole episode just on affairs because uh, I think it's such a... a a big question for people. Um, and maybe in another one, talk about singles, you know, the whole dating scene. Really? Yeah, <laughs> interesting places one can go. But yes. this is lovely. Thank you very much. No, I you're so welcome. I this chat. Long overdue, I think. Yes, so. yes. So, lockdown. Yes, for lockdown. <laughs> yes, for lockdown. And and once again, thank you for what you've meant to me and Nicolene in our marriage yeah. as well, for your yeah. guidance and, and wisdom and inputs. We appreciate you. Pleasure. Uh, Pleasure. So where can people reach you, Greta, when they when they need to contact you? How, how do they find you? I do have a website that uh, I thought now in lockdown I'm going to upgrade that, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I had too much fun in lockdown, got to know one another again. So there's a website, greatabecker.coza, and my email will be on there as, as well. Okay, great, great. My last question, Greta, before I say goodbye is, uh, like you know, this is called, this podcast is called Fresh Perspective. So what do you think you have a unique and fresh perspective on? Or what makes you odd um, but, but also gives you that edge of seeing something very different? Relationship-wise or general? General, just um, or both. Now you got me no. curious. Oh, oh, that's a big question. I'll ask again, Francois. What is a new fresh perspective for me? (laughs) Oh, I tell you what. Yeah. 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 How do you see life differently? What do you think uh, makes you see you have a a unique way of seeing life? What gives me a unique way of seeing life? Francois, I think I've come back to where we started, the fact that I'm in the autumn of my life and I can give myself the privilege to just be um, and sit back and not do a lot of stuff. Um, So my perspectives actually at this stage come from reading a lot, especially new things. and then I came back to an old perspective, uh, Francois, is that the world is a strange place at this stage. We do not know what's going to happen even tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this black swan, I never thought in my life I would see a black swan event. I've always heard about black swans, but now it's happened. And I realize that if if you'd grounded and in something bigger than yourself, you're going to be blown around in this wind and waves of new things and COVID nineteen. And am I going to make it? Am I going to die? What's going to happen to me? Is is the business going to make it? There's a lot of doom and gloom. Mm. So what what is that capacity? What is it that we need to have to stay positive, grounded, still laugh, still have a sense of humor? And for me, that is to be attached 
to a higher power outside myself. I think if you're not grounded in something way more than just the world, um, it's going to be very difficult. So I'm reading a lot of my, um, in my Bible again at, at this age, and I'm looking for a lot of answers in this old book that's been around for how many centuries, Francois? Yeah, I don't know. But uh, so I'm, I'm, and I'm getting so many fresh perspectives out of just reading the ancient book of them all. Um, yeah. Yeah. And feeling positive and relaxed and calm about it. So, I can, so I can I see. I can see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got friends who are petrified to go out of the house, yeah. and when they see somebody not wearing a mask, they like, "How can you do that?" And for it goes over me. Len and I go walk. I walk to the shops at ten o'clock in the morning. I go and buy my bread and milk, and some policeman must try and stop me. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not scared of the virus. I'm not scared of the police. Um, it's nice to be in the autumn of my life where I'm calm and at peace and hopefully not ancient, but uh, happy and content. You know. So that's Thank my perspective at this stage. I love it. Love it. Yeah. That's why I immediately asked you about that. So it makes yeah. sense that that's your fresh perspective, your fresh take on life. So, so my question that I want to well, that I ask people: What are you holding on to in this crazy time of a black swan event that got the world topsy turvy? Mm -hmm. What do you hold? What is your rock? What are you holding on for sanity? So that's me, Francois. Thank you so much, Greta. Thank you once again. Great chatting. I love you, Nicolina, and the kids. I saw them on Facebook. They're beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And say hi to Len for me. I will. Stay well. You too. Okay. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.